We are uh, working with the main differences between biblical traditions or biblical doctrine and the doctrines created by men. And especially this time, we are dealing with the presentation of the gospel to Roman Catholics. This is an exercise in love. The best way that we can love you or anyone who doesn't know the Bible or doesn't know the plan of salvation is for us to present it to them, even if these doctrines are strange for people who never heard the gospel. I just did a video uh, of greetings for Christmas, I mean, for, um, for the time of resurrection. And basically I mentioned chapter five of John, John chapter five, verse 25, 28 and 29. And in verse 25, the Lord Jesus, from the lips of Jesus himself, he says, the time is coming, and it is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of Man. And those who hear the voice of the Son of Man will become alive, will come to life, will be resurrected, will be regenerated because God has given those people ears to hear and eyes to see. And those who hear the Son then can go into verse 28, and 29, where it says, it will come the time with all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And that is the very last day. And they will be resurrected. And those who did good, which means those who believe, because without faith, no one can glorify God. Without faith, no one can please God. So those who did good, those who had faith, will come to the resurrection of life eternal. And those who did not listen to the Son of Man will come to the resurrection of eternal punishment. I'm paraphrasing this, but those are the two basic uh, or three basic uh, verses in the Bible that can be terrifying because I am pleading with everyone to not only to believe in Jesus, but to believe Jesus. If he says that those who hear him and believe and trust in him will have eternal life. And those who do not will not have eternal life, but will be eternally condemned. Then our hearts will go to everyone who hears this. It is so important to know that in order to be safe, one has to put his faith in Christ, trust in Christ, but exclusively, not inclusively, exclusively. Because if anyone doesn't hear verse 25, you know, that all of us who were dead in trespasses and sins will come 
to life when we trust in Christ, when we hear his voice. Then when we are in the grave, we will not hear. We will we hear just the voice of God. Anyone who doesn't listen to verse 25 and arrives at verse 28 and 29, it, to hear the voice of God at that time is way too late. So it is an expression of love for us to share with all of you that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, zero, goes to my Father, but through me, no one can go to the Father, but through Jesus. So let me show you these five fingers. If we have all these means of salvation, we have Jesus, why not? We have the good works. We have the priests. We have other saints. And we have all the traditions of men faithfully kept. And you can go on and on and you can have all these gods, but among them, you also have Jesus. This is eternal condemnation because he does not want any, anyone to be just part of the equation of salvation is the exclusivity of Jesus. And we need to believe what the Bible says, and we need to believe what Jesus says. I know it is difficult to get out of a system that has been poor on us since we were born. For the Muslims, it is exactly the same thing. They have a hard time coming out of Muslims' religion because that's all they learn. And they are afraid to really betray their own families. For the Jewish people, the same thing. The Jewish people, the moment they believe in Christ alone, the family will hold a funeral for them because they are pull aside. So in this introduction, I would like to go back to that idea that the only way of salvation is Christ alone. Not Christ and St. Peter's, not Christ and the Virgin Mary, not Christ and the priests, not Christ and your good works, not Christ or and the sacraments, not Christ and all the other things that we would like to add to what the Bible says, but it is Christ alone. And let me repeat, we honor and love Mary and the saints, but we cannot go to them for salvation. That is prohibited. We do not have any other way. There is no a single individual on earth, above the earth, through whom we can be saved, but Jesus alone. So the traditions of the Roman church uh, also uh, put together seven sacraments, and we already talked about some of those sacraments. One sacrament that they established was the sacrament of matrimony, another one, order, another one, extreme unction, another one, another sacrament is the confirmation, and another sacrament is the penance or confession. Those five sacraments 
are not sacraments. In the Bible, we only find two, which is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those are two big differences between what the Bible says and what Roman Catholicism has imposed upon people. First of all, I have to tell you that the sacrament of baptism, the ordinance of baptism, has been really changed in the Roman Catholic Church. Because when John the, John the Baptist was baptizing people, he said, I just baptized with water, which is for some kind of repentance. But there is one amongst you who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and that is the Lord Jesus. So the real baptism is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When someone trust in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, convincing that person that he needs to repent and run to Jesus, at that moment that person is baptized by the Holy Spirit. The baptism of water does not save anybody. It is the baptism of the Holy Spirit when the person is regenerated, is given a new life in the spirit. I'll give you my spirit. I give you a new heart and you shall be my people and I shall be your God. That's what he says all the way from the Old Testament. I will wash you with clean waters. And I do this and I do that and I do the other God keeps saying that. So you can do that. Once you believe and you are regenerated, now you can do what is right and to live a holy life, not to be safe, but to demonstrate to yourself, to your heart and to the rest of the world and to God that you indeed have believed. So we don't take away good works. We take good works away for salvation, but the good works stay as a result of the fact that the person is safe. We already talked last week about the Last Supper, so I'm not going to review that one. Now, the confirmation in the Roman Catholic Church is different than really a, a, an exercise that is done in the biblical way. When a person believes in Christ alone for his salvation, that person publicly declares that he trusts in Christ because now he understands what baptism was <clears throat> that was not to save him, but is the faith that saved him. And for other uh, sections of Christianity, they really do not baptize anyone until the person expresses faith in Christ. But Again, it doesn't matter because the baptism of water does not save anybody. If a child receives baptism, but that child never comes to faith in Christ, that person, and dies like that without faith in Christ, that person is, is going to perish. But if an adult receives baptism and declares, a faith in Christ, but is not a true faith in Christ, he is in the same situation. If he never comes to faith in Christ and dies without that faith in Christ, the person obviously perishes. Now, in Roman Catholicism, 
the children go to confirmation, but they do not know what they are doing. And many of us were Roman Catholics. We went those days when, when the bishop came, and the bishop will give you a touch in the face or a slap on the face to, for the bishop to give the child the Holy Spirit. That is not biblical because the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, as he speaks to Nicodemus, doesn't show up under the commandment of anybody. The Holy Spirit is like the wind, he said to Nicodemus, that flows, we don't know where it comes or where it goes. And it is up to God himself to send the Holy Spirit to whomever he wants to save. And again, we will get a little bit into the doctrines of the Reformation, indicating that salvation depends upon the total sovereignty of God, who indicated from the beginning in the Gospel of Matthew, Chapter 1, verse 21, where it says that Jesus, his name shall be Jesus because he came to save not everyone, but his people from their sins. <clears throat> and then the high prayer, uh, high uh, priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus in uh, chapter 5 of John, verse 17, I mean, Pardon me. In, in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, the entire chapter, Jesus says that he came to, to save the Father's sheep. You have given them to me. You chose them. And you gave them to me so I can save. And none of the ones that you came, that you sent me to save, will perish. So the reason why we believe is because God gave us that faith to trust in Christ. Why I'm, I am saying these things? Because as, after I did this video, I discovered that many Roman Catholics did not even understand. And they write back saying, so what? We believe in Christ. But what they do not understand is that in order to believe in Christ, has to be exclusively in Christ and Christ alone. Because then you will have all those gods, and among them you have Jesus, and he is not going to tolerate that for a single second. Now, that confirmation then it, that is an exercise in nothing, because a bishop, a man, cannot give you the Holy Spirit. Now, confession of sin is in the Bible, but it says, confess your sins one to another. That means that we need, indeed, to have someone who is accountable to, that we are accountable to, a brother, a sister, that we can share and say, I did these things. I, you know, would you help me? and grow together. But then when you finish confessing those sins to that person, is the time for the other person to confess the sin. So, uh, and no one has the authority to give forgiveness because we became, all of us became priests. In the sense that when the veil of the temple rip apart, when Jesus says, all is finished, the priesthood of men, of certain men, was terminated because the priest in the Old Testament was in charge of taking the sins of the people, go through the veil, and present it to God for forgiveness. But now, since the veil of the temple was ripped, as Jesus said, all is finished, all, have, all of us have the right to enter the temple like the priest does directly to deal with God and confess our sins to God. 
Confession is important because it's the demonstration of repentance. What is a confession? Is when we tell God, I agree with you that I am a sinner. I agree with you that I sin. Forgive me. And God forgives you your sins because of the fact that Jesus is your priest, is our high priest, always pleading for us in front of the Father. So confession is important. Confession means that we agree that we have committed a sin. We confess it. We don't hide it. And we confess it to God and we don't want to do it again. Again, you can also share this with others. The other case of forgiveness of sin is in the case of the discipline of the church. When a person lives in sin, practice sin, and the church finds out, the person has to come in front of three or more members of the church, pastors or leaders, or the, or the session, and the person is confronted with the sin. If the person refuses, refuses to repent, that person is excommunicated. And in Matthew 18, 15 or 15, 18, uh, in Matthew 18, 15, it indicates that when two or more are exercising this power of holding this person responsible for their sin, God will honor that. But it's only within that context. And if the person comes back and repents, comes back to confess, I repent, and the church will take him back into the church, but not for, to forgiveness for salvation. They believe that the person has repented and now is part of the member of the church. That is the context of confession. Now, the sacrament of matrimony that the church has established. Matrimony was not instituted by Jesus. So it's not a sacrament. The, the matrimony was instituted by God the Father in the garden. And all through the Bible, there are ways to deal with matrimony. I have to tell you, dear Catholics, that the word annulment of a matrimony is not in the Bible. And this is one of the main problems of Roman Catholics who had divorce and remarry. Because the Bible, believe it or not, has rules for biblical divorce. And there are, there, there are specific rules that God gives for divorce. I'd like to take you to 1 Corinthians chap chapter 7. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, there is one of the most clear ordinances for dealing with biblical divorce. I have to tell you a little story. We, Mimi and I, traveled to Argentina and from Argentina to Santiago de Chile and from Santiago, after being in Santiago, I believe that I have uh, spoken over 100 hours during the time that we were there teaching. 
And Mimi asked me, please do not teach anymore. Because whenever someone asks you a question, what do you do? <clears throat> People are so motivated to know who God is. <clears throat> and concerned with the plan of salvation that they ask you, and soon you will get a group of people and you are talking again. So she says, joking, no more Bible, no more, no more theology, no more religion, just go and rest. And she pushed me to go and rest. And we went to Viña del Mar, beautiful Viña del Mar in um, Chile. And we rested and I obey Mimi because uh, she was looking for, for, for my help. Even Jesus rested. So, and she, and she brings that thought home quite often. She went to the beauty salon and I was in my hotel room and then it was time for tea. Mimi as a good European, Tea is important to her, so I went down to look for her to take her for tea. She was in the beauty salon. I walked in, and one of the best ways to honor marriage is to love your wife like the queen of everything, that everyone will know that she is special to you. That is the best gift that God has given you after Jesus. And you have to express it, not only to her, but other people have to know that you honor that, that marriage commitment. And I walked into a beauty salon and I said, I'm looking for the most beautiful woman of the entire world. And the lady said, here I am. And I say, no, it's not. So she's, they said, oh, is the American, they call La Gringa. I say, I say yep. So she said, she's not ready. So the lady sat there, and we sat there, and she said, could I do your nails? In Latin America, men do their nails, it's part of the culture. I said, okay. She began to ask me, what are you doing in Latin America? And I changed the subject because I have promised Mimi that I was not going to talk about religion. So I say, tell me about Pablo Neruda, which is right here next to, in Valparaíso, next to Viña del Mar. And she told me about Pablo Neruda. And then she says, but what are you doing? What did, what did you, I say, I was teaching in, uh, in Buenos Aires and now here. And says, what did you teach? I say, why don't you tell me about the festival of music in Viña del Mar? And I changed the subject so many times that eventually she stopped and she says, I noticed that you don't want to talk about what you do. What is it that you do? I said, I teach. So what do you teach? I say, theology. What? Theology. What? Speak clearly. Theology. She said, theology. She pushed the table against me, became extremely angry. It was like a lioness. Her contents of her face and everything changed. And she says, I hate people like you. I hate theologian. I hate I, I, I am, I've been waiting 14 years to go to hell and it didn't happen yet. And I live in torture because of you guys. I said, tell me about it. She said, 18 years ago, my husband left me for another woman and we got divorced. And since then, I wanted to marry again, but they, the church does not allow me because I am a 
Roman Catholic, and I have to get an annulment. And an annulment is extremely expensive. And there are so many circumstances that I cannot. And since I did not get an annulment, the person, I live with a person. I want to marry this person. We have three children with this person. And when I go to the priest, the priest tell me, I'm sorry, I cannot give you communion or confession. You come to church, but at the end of, the, of your life, you're going to hell anyway, unless you leave that man that you live with. Whoa. When she said that, I took her to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And it says that in, 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 in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to paraphrase because I am running against time here. But it says that if... Uh, if to the married I command, that the woman, but even if she does not depart, let her remain unmarried. Let me let me read it. Uh, um, let, is, let, let me read it. it. Read it beginning in verse ten. Now to the married I commanded, yet not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Verse 12. Um, but to the rest I... Uh, not the Lord, says, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if the husband does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Let me tell you when he says, I said not the Lord, he is saying when the Lord spoke about divorce, he didn't give the, these specifics. So I'm giving you these specifics because Jesus said that God hates divorce, that a man should not divorce his wife and the wife a husband. Because God don't let men separate what God had put together. And in my case, he says, I hate divorce. So he is elaborating that. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, you know, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Verse 15. Let me share this with you. Sanctify means mean means a process of sanctification but not become a believer because you're just married to an unbeliever. Let me repeat this. If a believer lives with another believer, there is no divorce unless one of them commits adultery. And Jesus says that clearly in his gospel. A man shall not leave his wife unless for case of immorality, of in, in the case of adultery. Listen to this. If a believer lives with a person who is not a believer and the believer wants to stay, you must stay. You cannot divorce that person. But if the unbeliever leaves, then you must let him leave. 
But if the unbeliever departs, verse 15, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such a case, but God has called us to peace. Now, let me, let me review this. Here, Jesus, in Mark and in Matthew, I believe it's 19, is talking about divorce and is talking about biblical divorce, that divorce is granted in case of immorality, in case of adultery. And it is a biblical divorce. The person who commits adultery never gets free. But the one to against the adultery was committed, that person can remarry. And when I began to explain to her, she began to understand because she was the one who stayed. The husband was the one who committed adultery and left and remarried somebody else totally out of the uh, uh, Roman system. Now, this is a biblical divorce. In case of adultery is one of the cases. There are two more or three more cases, but this is the main one. So the person against whom adultery was committed is free to remarry. That's a biblical divorce. And if that person remarries and then comes to the knowledge of Christ, that person cannot depart from this person and go back. Now, this is very interesting. If there are, if the person even is an unbeliever and that person divorces and remarries, that person still is an unbeliever. But if that person eventually comes to Christ, that person is a new creation and must stay in the place that God found her or found him when he believes. Verse 20, let each one remain in the same college, calling in which he was called. What you call while well, slave, do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's free man. Like, likewise, he who is called while free is a Christ's slave. Verse 24, brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in, in which he was called. So I explained to this lady that in front of God, she had a biblical divorce. That in front of God, she could freely marry this man that, he was, that she was living with. Not only that, but I show her 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it says that when you come to Christ, you are a brand new creation. Everything that happened before is gone. So you are free, you are free in Christ. You are a new baby in Christ. She was listening to all of this and began to cry. She said, I had been under slavery for 14 years thinking <clears throat> that I have to get a silly annulment in order for me to go to heaven. And I explained to her that all she needed to do, to do is to know Christ. And Christ will give you all the freedom. So this is a kind of slavery that many Roman Catholics live in. So this lady 
came to Christ that day. It took almost two and a half hours to explain all of this and the plan of salvation. And she called, they called a pastor. And the pastor said, what's the matter with you? I've been telling you all of this all these days, all these years. And she looked at me and she said, you did not come to Latin America to teach anything. God sent you here to Viña del Mar as an angel to open the doors of heaven for me. Thank you. And so this story, you can repeat it hundreds of times because it, ha it has happened to us a number of times. A Roman Catholic in my home rejected everything that I told him. When I said, are you sure that you are going to heaven? And he said, yes, I'm a good person and things like that. So there's no reason for me to go to heaven. After explaining to him that being good doesn't take you to heaven. It's trusting in Christ and living that faith in Christ that will take you to heaven. But what will take you to heaven definitely is trusting in Christ alone. The work that you do is just the result of the fact that you are saved. And as... He was leaving my studio at home. I asked him, I said, are you sure you are going to heaven? And he turned around and he says, yes, except for the fact that I am married and divorced. So I am living in sin. So I probably will not make it. So I say, let me take you, tell you about 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You know, so... What am I saying? These sacraments are an imposition on things where the Bible clearly says, do not add anything to the scriptures and do not take anything away from this. So that's your matrimony for you. It is, it, 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 the Bible has clear rules and Jesus himself, establish the rules for biblical divorce. Divorce shall not happen, but if it happens, there are some rules that have to be followed. So, then we have the sacrament of order, holy orders. And the holy orders is where a man is ordained to be a priest or a monk or a brother. And at that moment, that person cannot be married. That is not in the Bible. The Bible says that a minister of the gospel needs to be married, be the husband of one wife that go governs well his house, so he, in turn, can govern well the, the business of the church. Uh, in, in the first letter of Timothy, it indicates that all the conditions for a person to be the, a pastor. And obviously, when you institute these holy orders in an unbiblical way, you are looking for a lot of problems because the Bible says it is not good for a man to be alone. I was not going to bring this up in this video, but the more I read about it and the more I hear other people talk about the scandals in the church, I have to say that there are 
thousands of abuses of children by priests. And the institution have spent millions of dollars covering up all these sins. There is a tremendous uh, uh, problem with sin, sexual sin, in the in, in, within these men and women who are living a life that God did not ordain. In First uh, Timothy chapter three, it says, verse one: "This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work." Bishop is an overseer, is a pastor. A bishop, bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospital, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? So a priest has to be married if he wants to be a priest. First of all, we read in the book of Hebrews that the priest cannot exist any longer that it was totally replaced by only one priest, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the priest, the, the, the office of a priest, belongs in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it was totally replaced by the office of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only priest. And then the Bible Institute, pastors, and what is the difference between a pastor and a priest? A priest, according to the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church, has the ability to save people. A pastor cannot save anybody. A priest saves somebody by baptizing them, then by confessing them, and then by uh, giving them the Holy Spirit and then by uh, uh, applying the last rites of the extreme unction, and then by praying for them when they, these people were not able to do enough works and enough uh, penance, uh, so they go to a place that they invented called purgatory. But those things do not exist. These holy orders are really a sacrilege. It's, 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 it's something that is not in the Bible. The sacred orders, the way the tradition of the church applies, is so terrible that one of these priests eventually becomes a bishop and he has powers, more powers than a priest and eventually becomes a cardinal, and eventually becomes a pope. And this man, a mere man, becomes the holy, infallible father. That is a tragedy, because that is taking the place of the holy God, and is only one holy, infallible father. And that is God himself. And since the Pope and the councils and these holy orders, given the, the authority that is not authority at all in the Bible, <clears throat> to create doctrines, they come to replace or to add to the authority of the Holy Bible. So this is a tragedy. That is the sacrament that they call. And then we have the sacrament of the Holy 
uh, of the extreme unction or the last rites. And that is when a person is about to die, the priest runs, or they call the priest to give you the last confessions because if you do not, if you die without, without that confession and you have mortal sins, you go directly to hell. But if you have forgotten to confess some of your sins and they are not mortal, they are venial, then you go to purgatory and then you have to run to the priest to take you out of purgatory by saying masses that we need to pay for. It's as if we have to pay for a firefighter to take you out of a house that is burning and they will not take you out as less, unless you pay. Those are called indulgences. You see how ridiculous this is? The Pope and, the, and these holy orders begin to create something that only belongs to God, the ability to take people to heaven. And they call indulgences. We will work a little bit on those indulgences, but there are all kinds of indulgences. If you pay money in advance, you can actually buy indulgences in advance that gives you the right to sin because it's already paid for. And that was the reason why the Reformation began. Tessel began to sell indulgences in Germany. And that's when Martin Luther began to look at that and they say, I'm sorry, that is not in the Bible. And today, under the nose of the Pope, there is a place in Rome called the Scala Santa, the Holy Steps, that if you go up the steps on a Holy Friday, and you pray for the intentions of the Pope on each step, when you come up, you have gained full indulgences. All your sins are paid for, so you are free to go to heaven without going to purgatory. That is not the gospel. I am sorry, I, and I am not angry, I'm just very concerned. I don't know if this makes any sense, you know, but it is, it, you need to be, uh, to, to be aware of what the Bible says. And on top of that, these men with holy orders, beginning with the Pope and the councils, forbid the per people to read the Bible. So they will not discover what God has established for them, rather that they could continue to depend upon this church that is inventing rules. And then, obviously, when we talk about the extreme unction, they are saying that James says that it's good for the elders of the church to go and anointed people with oil. But I cannot get into the debate on this because we don't have the time. We will never finish. But that, that anointing with oil, in, in those times, the oil will have certain abilities to release pain and to do all this. But they took it as literally in the last rites to, on, to put oil in the forehead and every place, uh, every hand and, and, and feet and, and so on. And then if the person is able to speak, uh, they, they will do confession and they get absolution. And if they can eat, they can take communion. And if they die, they agree that they will go to heaven because they didn't have any more time to sin. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. But the, what is tragic, dear ones, is that in many cases, and I can say that because I went with priests. I was going to be a Roman Catholic priest. And to do that, you have to learn. I went to priests where they put the last rites on people 
who had already died. And the priest will touch it and say, it's still warm, we'll give it to them before they become cold. It's nonsense. In any event, th there you have it. S sacraments that are instituted by men, not by God. <clears throat> well, I would like to go through the main differences between Roman Catholicism and biblical theology. But before I go to that, may I give you a sh short summary of the history of papacy? That might be something that you would like to know, to see really, and especially for the Roman Catholics that may not know this, the office of papacy is one of the most corrupted offices in the entire world. As, you, as we explained last week, that the majority of the popes were named by governors beginning with the first uh, bishop of Rome that was put in place by the emperor Constantine in the year 312 or something like that. Then it went uh, in 537, uh, it began the um, Byzantine papacy, where the Byzantines, the government in, uh, in, in, of the Greek Orthodox, it did not exist yet, Greek Orthodox began in the year, in the 11th century, 1005, or 1054 or something like that. But then uh, the Pope came back to when uh, to to Rome, and the Pope was attacked by the other emperors and uh, governments of North Italy. So the Pope in order not to lose the uh, papacy in 799, uh, Leo III went to, uh, pardon me, uh, Stephen II uh, went by foot, trust, uh, went through the Alps and went to uh, 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 King Pepin. And, Pepin, and plead that they will come and defend them from the Byzantines and the others who were taking the papal states. And indeed, uh, the uh, Pepin was able to uh, defend the Pope. And then Leo III in 799 was also attacked. So he remembered that, that the Pope before went to France and did the same thing. That was Leo III. And then he there convinced Charlemagne to come back and defend him. And he did. And he crowned Charlemagne now on uh, the, uh, uh, the emperor. And now the, the papacy became, began to live under the uh, government of the emperors of France. Uh, it continued and eventually uh, Rome, uh, uh, the, the French lost power uh, to the Germans. And Germans, uh, Otto I became the Holy Roman Emperor. And now the papacy was not on the any ecclesiastical rule, but under the emperor of 
Germany. And they began, since there were governments fighting for who was going to be the Pope, they began to name different Popes. So what I am saying this is that there is not a sequence of Popes and Popes as communicated mutually each other. Uh, then in uh, 1059, Pope Nicholas established the College of Cardinals. And then uh, this Pope Nicholas, his uh, name is Heidelberg or Gregory, pardon me, Heidelberg was Gregory the VII. And Gregory the VII came and finished or end up with the priest being able to marry. Up to that moment, the priest could marry. And this Gregory the VII established celibacy, celibacy for the priest. Then in 1257, uh, it was very dangerous to live in Rome for the popes. So they moved to where? To France. They went uh, uh, to Avignon. And Avignon, they lived there for 70 years. And now they are not under the ecclesiastical government. They are under the government of what? France. <laughs> Again. Uh, so you see uh, the... Uh, how, how this, this uh, succession of popes is not holy at all. Uh, then uh, the popes came back from Avignon, <clears throat> and then you have another division, because the pope in Avignon will not give up his title as pope. And now we have, again, popes as communicating each other. Then we have uh, the, uh, the time in papacy where the, where the popes were elected by nations and the last nation to, to take control on popes was both Italy, but also uh, uh, Spain. And Spain we have, in the time of the discovery of America, in, 19, in 1492, uh, you have Alexander VI, which, uh, whose name is Rodrigo Borges. And Rodrigo Borges became the Pope. He bought the papacy. And he, let me read a little bit about Rodrigo Borges. In, nine, in 1492, and remember that Queen Isabel was really in control of everything, of the entire world. Spain had become an empire. So the church has now on, is now under the empire. Rodrigo Borgia from Spain purchased the papacy. And I'm reading from a, a book that I took, written by Catholics under the imprimatur, with permission of the bishop. To write it. Uh, in 1492 to 1503, Rodrigo Borgia from Spain purchased the papacy. Much money was in his hand from the discovery of America, and he wielded extraordinary powers because he led Spain, the Spanish Inquisition. That's much blood. Spanish Inquisition, anyone who do not become a Catholic will be tortured. Or it, it was the torture that carried much blood, not only in Europe, but especially in, in Latin America. 
Um, he brought his children and his daughter Lucrecia and sons that he appointed cardinals. The Popol household was filled with intrigue and murder and sexual immorality. It says that whatever Lucrecia wanted, Lucrecia will get it. And at one point, they did not know if Alexander the six was, uh, was dealing with the matters of the church or Lucrecia. Uh, obviously, at that point, the Medici family then is switched, eventually switched from the papacy being controlled by governments and went to the hands of very influential, important families in Italy. And the Medici family was waiting for the opportunity for Julius II to become the Pope. Who is Julius II? Julius II is the Pope who really began the building of the Basilica of St. Peter's and imposed much more uh, requirements for the selling of indulgences because when they began to run out of money, they needed the money to build the... Um, but something weird happens. Someone ran ahead of him and uh, Pius the, uh, the, the third, a nephew of Pius the second, become Pope. And here we begin to call nepotism. The popes were elected by families. And who is good in the family? And then the, the Pope began to ordain cardinals according to their families. And that's the word nepotism began. R.C. Sproul used to say, nepotism is not good unless it stays within the family. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this Pope, Pius III, became a Pope and lasted 26 days. And he died after a special dinner invitation with mushrooms. So you can see what happened. And then comes Julius II. And we are looking here, 1503, of 1502, 1503 to 1513. Doesn't sound like close to who? Reformation time. We are getting very close to 1517, which was when the Reformation came. During this kind of, of scandalous life, Martin Luther visited Rome looking for morality and holiness in the holy city and discover a bank of immorality. Discover he was so sad when he returned to. Uh, Julius II <clears throat> is actually called General Julius II because he became a warrior. And is when they have the papal states and the popes concentrated and gaining territories and gaining the papal states. Actually, believe it or not, these papal states stay in put in place until Victor Emmanuel, the one who unified Italy, came and took all the papal states. And they said that Pius IX met the 
Emmanuel, uh, King Emmanuel, at the doors of Rome with the bull of excommunication against Emmanuel. Emmanuel took the excommunication bull and the papal states too. <laughs> Interesting enough, they, well, I'll, 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 I'll go back. But don't you find this? How in the world do you think this is a sacred place? How in the world do you think it is when the Pope become and Julius II was famous for establishing Rome as Rome is today? Many of the beautiful buildings and beautiful things beautified the city of Rome. And he was really, they, they, they call him a warrior because he will go in front of his army to fight. That's Julius II, and I hope that you remember because he was the one who began the building of the Basilica of St. Peter's. After Julius, Julius II came in 1513, Leo X. Leo X, I, I don't have the time to read it, but it's embarrassing what he did. Beginning with, well, you have to read it. When, when you see how corrupted this Pope was, it is an amazing thing. But Pius X met with the Reformation. With all these scandalous things that were happening, obviously, obviously, uh, the Reformation was there not to divide the church, but what Martin Luther wanted was to reform the church, to bring it back to the biblical principles. And when they told Leo X what happened, he gave some time, but then when, when Martin Luther and the Reformation began to grow, then Leo X wrote a bull of us communication against Martin Luther. Let me tell you something about Leo X. He was a hunter and he used to hunt um, uh, wild boars. And he wrote, Oh Lord, stand up because a wild boar has been raised in your vineyard. And that was Martin Luther. Well, uh, the in 1846 to 17 to 1878, we have a pope that is really famous uh, for all the nonsense that he did, but also he was able to reclaim some of the papal states, and that was Pius the Ninth. And Pius the Ninth was the, the one who uh, met with Victor Emmanuel. He was the one who declared the Immaculate Conception from the air, from his own ideas. And since even the theologians, the Roman the Catholic theologians, opposed to that, some of them, then uh, he eventually, in 1870, was the first pope that became infallible, so his ideas will stand as truth, infallible truths. Before 1870, the pope was not infallible. Now the pope is infallible on the dogma of faith. If any Catholic trusts in Christ alone for his salvation, but does not believe that the pope is infallible, that person is condemned to hell. That is 
a grave sin, a mortal sin. So um, the, the life continues, and then let's 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 jump. We were we passed way beyond our time and way beyond the Reformation. So I like to go a little bit to our list of of um, of heresies and doctrines because you'll find there the Reformation. And we are, uh, remember the list of, uh, I don't think you have the list, but she has a copy of all the history of the, you have it? Okay. Uh, notice that in In 1517 comes Martin Luther. Martin Luther, the, one of the things that he opposed the most was the indulgences that Tessel was selling. And they did all kind of theatrics. They will say, oh, your poor mother is burning in purgatory and you have the ability to rescue her by putting money in this place and will give you a paper signed by the Pope that you will get an indulgences and she can come out from that burning place now. And they will do this to people, the countryside people without any education who only thought that the, the church has the authority to do that. And Martin Luther saw what they were doing with the peasants and he became angry and called the peasants and says, you are going to have with this? Look, that's the end of your heaven. <laughs> This is not, so he posted 95 theses in front of the church to discuss it with his students, condemning the indulgences and all these abuses of the Roman church. And came up looking into the scriptures with the along with the reformers, with the basic plan of salvation offered to men, around, men and women around the world by the Bible. And that plan of salvation was this, very simple. The Bible is the supreme authority. These corrupted popes and councils where they poison each other, where they bought votes from each other, where they threaten each other, are not the authority. The supreme authority is the Bible. It came out with sola scriptura, indicating that the Bible is the supreme authority. Then the second doctrine that is simple is sola gratia. In Latin, in English, is grace alone. And grace alone means that no one can buy salvation because they were buying salvation. It's a gift of God. Because you are saved by faith, through, um, by grace through faith in Christ alone, as Ephesians chapter 2 said. And I will recommend any Roman Catholic who is listening to this to read Ephesians chapter 2. It will show you clearly that salvation is by faith alone, that is not by works, 
sin, but it is a gift of God. So, five basic points that the Reformation established. The supreme authority is the Bible, sola scriptura. Salvation is a gift from God, sola gratia, grace alone. And what is the instrument of salvation? Faith that is given to you by the Holy Spirit when you are confronted with the gospel. And faith in what? In the exclusivity of who? Christ. Christ alone. Solus Christus. And you are safe now. You never lose your salvation. And because you are safe, you are going to give glory to God. Soli Deo Gloria. Why? Because you are safe. That's the reason why we are safe. To give glory to God from the moment we are saved by living a good life, by doing what is right, by abiding in Christ, by doing what is right and living not a life without sin, because all of us sin, but a life of repentance. That the moment you sin, the Holy Spirit convicted you and you say, I hate this sin. I don't want to sin again. And you are working in a process of sanctification, but you are already holy. You are a child of God. Those are five principles. And then, uh, the other five principles that the Reformation uh, came with was the tulip that men, that's called toti, is total depravity. That man is born in sin and dead in our own arrival without the ability to look for God. What does it mean? Total depravity means that man was created perfect and well, but man sinned and, and became dead. And when he becomes spiritually dead, he says, if you eat of this fruit, you will die. God said that. Men ate and men die spiritually, but also die physically because they become, the cells in the body began to die. And you became to get wrinkled and old. And he says, what is happening here? So is the the death of the human. So, when you are dead, you cannot look for God. So you are totally incapacitated to look for God. So what happened? God has to give you a new life through faith in Christ. And when you get a new life, you are not depraved anymore because you have the ability now to choose between good and evil. But before that regeneration, you only choose evil. And you think that some things that are <clears throat> less bad than others, they're good. But they're all bad. And it, it says in, uh, in Hebrews, <clears throat> without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, we live in sin. Then, unconditional election. I cannot be sufficiently good for God to accept me. Because in Romans 5, verse 8 or 6, it says that when we were dead, when we were totally wicked, someone decided to die for us. <clears throat> Not when we were good, but when we were bad, weak, and trespasses and sin. And when that regeneration come, comes to the people that God has the ability to give that faith to believe. If you believe in Christ alone, it's because you have been chosen by God 
unconditionally without any of your work. So that is unconditional election. And then L, limited atonement. The only ones who are safe are those that trust in Christ alone for their salvation. So it's limited only to those who believe in Christ. So if you believe in Christ alone for your salvation, today you have been chosen by God because it's limited to the ones who believe. So it's not for the entire world, but for people from the entire world, from every nation, everyone in the entire world who believes in Christ is chosen by God. In John chapter 6, 44 and 45 and 65, it says that no one can come to me. <clears throat> no one. Because you can't. You are totally depraved. Unless, what is the essential condition? Necessary condition. Unless the Father will bring him. So if the Father will give you that faith through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will run to Christ. If you don't trust in Christ alone, it's because the Father still has not taken you directly to Jesus. But today can be the day of salvation. You are listening to the plan of salvation. What is it that calls you or anybody to come? And then you have total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, limited to those who trust in Christ alone, and I, ir lip, uh, tulip, irresistible grace. What happens? When you are saved, when God gives you that salvation, you cannot not go. <laughs> you cannot not go. You run like a person who has been walking for five days in the desert without water, and you'll see water. What do you do? Irresistibly, you run to that water. And that's what Jesus says. Come without money. Come to the water. I am the water. of. I am the, the, the living waters. Uh, and I'll give you waters that you will never be thirst again. So that is irresistible grace. And the P is so beautiful. That's probably the main difference between Roman Catholicism and any other religion. That we are sure that we will never, ever lose our salvation. Because God preserves his saints. In Philippians chapter 1, I believe, is verse 6, that it says that God will end, will finish what he began. He is the one who gave us salvation. So therefore, he is going to keep it. He is not someone who gives and takes it away. He will. And since he is the one who gives us that salvation, we will never lose it. And we will never lose it because God is immutable. God doesn't change. If I am the one who says, I'm going to get my salvation because I decided to go to confession today and I got it myself, thank you very much, I can change my mind. So that's why a Roman Catholic never is sure if he is going to heaven because it does not depend upon Christ alone, but depends upon a priest that does not exist, who gives you the plan of salvation. So that is your tulip. And one of the most beautiful doctrines in the Bible is the sovereignty of God. Nothing, absolutely nothing, not even your, your salvation, 
depends upon yourself or anybody or circumstances. It depends upon the absolute counsel of God, the sovereignty of God. So, uh, the Reformation came in 1517. These doctrines were presented and the Roman Church responded with the establishment of the Council of Trent, which was created. Uh, the church got uh, together and in the year 1545, put together the Council of Trent. That's number 37 in your list. And the Council of Trent gave, declared that the Bible and the traditions of the church and the authority of the church are equal. You see the attack of the Reformation? The Reformation says, sola scriptura. They say, no, no, no. <clears throat> we have three authorities that are equal. They establish the, uh, 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 they declare <clears throat> hundreds of anathemas of condemnation. And I will encourage you to read the declarations, the anathemas that the, the Council of Trent has established. The Council of Trent established that anyone who is not a Catholic is going to hell. Period. Including the Protestants. All the reformers and all the, the, the ones who trust in the Bible alone are going to hell. Anyone who trusts in Christ alone goes to hell. Anyone who claims that he doesn't lose his salvation, he is going to hell. Anyone who thinks that salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, is going to hell. Anyone who doesn't believe in purgatory is going to hell. Anyone who doesn't believe... You go on and on and on and on. Um, in, um, in 1870, and you're talking hundreds of years, because the Council of Trent was in 1546, actually went from 1545 to 1560 something, with and with the space between that and during the war, <clears throat> but they did not change the condemnations of the Council of Trent. They kept the same doctrines. They did not change the doctrines, and, but they agreed that um, maybe uh, some uh, of the separated brethren can be called brothers again. And then the Second Vatican Council uh, agree with that, but the basic doctrines of the condemnation of the believing in, the, in those basic doctrines of the Bible will not change at all. Um, I have so much. <laughs> To, to share with you, but this, but you you can read in there. Uh, let me give you in the 20 minutes that are left, and if we have time, uh, we'll go into uh, Romans, I mean, evangelicals and Catholics together. And I hope that you will give me that little time to finish with evangelicals and Catholics together. But please take this paper. And uh, we begin by, on page one, 
by the way, this uh, paper was put together by a friend of mine who is in heaven now. He traveled with me to Mexico and to Peru, and he was a priest who came to the knowledge of Christ and uh, present the gospel without fear anywhere. In fact, we went to, I have to tell the story. We went to Peru, Sujana, together. And when I arrived a week, he, he, had, he had been already a week there and had presented the gospel everywhere. Everywhere. The only place that he did not go was the hospital because they didn't let him in. And the day before I left, or before I was ready to leave, they called me at 11 o'clock at night at the hotel and said, your friend is in the hospital. He was attacked in front of the Roman Catholic seminary at about 11 o'clock, and they cut one of his ears. And he ended up in the hospital. I arrived, and he was coming out of anesthesia. He says, no, hey, no, hey, where am I? Say, in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> this man wrote a book that I recommend to you, Farther from Rome, Far from Rome, Close to God near to God. But here it is. His name is, um, is uh, Richard Bennett. This, the, first of all, he presents the authority of the scriptures. The scriptures cannot be broken. That's what Jesus says. Uh, you cannot add anything to what is written. Uh, uh, Proverbs also, add thou not unto this work, lest reprove, he reprove thee, and so on. And uh, there is a number of, of passages there that you clearly know, including the last chapter of the Bible. I am telling you, you should not add or subtract anything that is Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 on. Uh, the comparison here is with the catechism. This catechism that I am showing you. This catechism ignores the Bible. Not only, not only ignores the Bible, but had the 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 sin to change what the Bible says and put something else in there, as we saw in Ephesians chapter one verse four and so on. Um, and the full authority in in the biblical church is the Bible. In the Roman Catholic Church, the full authority is not the Bible. It, there are three authorities, the Bible, the Church, and the traditions. Then, salvation by grace alone. You are justified by being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24 uh, Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that is not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, and so on. Those are a number of quotations that the Bible indicates that the instrument of salvation uh, is, is only grace, uh, and the instrument of salvation is faith. Um, in the Catechism, says that grace doesn't is not really the one that gives us the salvation. That grace only gives us the ability, God has given us the grace to save ourselves. Thank you very much. That is not 
God would save us, but we save ourselves, but it's by grace because God gave us the grace to save ourselves. And the salvation is not by this, but it's by sacraments. Uh, one who desires to obtain reconciliation with God and with the church must confess to a priest all the all the confessed grave sins he remembers after having carefully examined his conscience. So this salvation is by memory. If you forget any of your grave sins, you are not saved. So Christ is not the only one who saved. Faith. Uh, faith is God-given and sustained. That is the topic. In the, uh, in the church, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I mean, the Bible, and you shall be saved, you and your house. For unto, for unto you it is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. If you save, if you believe, you are safe. If you do not believe, you are already condemned. That's John 3.18. Uh, and in the Roman Catholic, it is the church that, gives, that believes first. So the church gives you the faith to believe. It's not God. Salvation comes from God alone, but because we receive the life of faith through the church, she is our mother. That's, and you can continue to read. Now, <clears throat> the sufficiency of Christ. This is probably the point, the principal point of division. The Roman Catholic Church does not believe in Christ alone. Adds all of these other components unto salvation. And that is really bad. Because if you believe in anybody else alone with Christ, you are straight to hell because Christ says, I am the way, not one of the ways, but the way, a, a definite article. So uh, it's, those are the main five points. On the other side, we have... <clears throat> And the biblical truth, the topic is God, the only, all, holy one. <clears throat> holy, holy, holy is the Lord. There is none holy as the Lord. 1 Samuel 2.20 I am the Lord, that is, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. That's Isaiah. In the Roman Catholic Church, you had many holy people. First of all, you have the Holy Father in Rome. By asking Mary to pray for us, we acknowledge ourselves to be poor sinners and we address ourselves as the Mother of Mercy, the All Holy One. This is what is written here in this catechism. There is only one who is holy. The fathers of the Eastern tradition, oh, pardon me, look at this, from the Roman Catholic tradition. Church, he learns that the example of holiness and recognizes the model, model and source in the All Holy Virgin Mary. All holiness comes from Mary. The, now, the fathers of the Eastern tradition call the Mother of God the All Holy One and celebrate her as free from any stain of sin, as though fashioned by the Holy Spirit and formed as a new cre creature. Now, one mediator in the biblical truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ, Jesus. 
That's 1 Timothy 2.5. What part of that we do not understand? It's only one mediator. It's not Mary. It's not Peter, even though we love them. It's not the priest. It's not your good works. It's only one mediator. Look at uh, Acts chapter 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other. There is no none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. The only name is Jesus Christ. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, Mary becomes a, mediate, a mediatrix. Taken upon, up to heaven, she did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gift of eternal salvation. She cannot do that. It's only Jesus. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church, and that is the Roman church, under the titles of advocate, helper, benefactress, and mediatrix. That's uh, verse 969 of this Roman Catholic catechism. Idolatry. God hates idolatry. God says in Exodus 24, 5, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images or any likeness of anything. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor to serve them. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them upon two tablets, tablets of stone. Take ye therefore good heed into yourself, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke. You know, no one took pictures of God. How can you take a picture of God? It is, it is terrible to, to make a picture of a hippie with blue eyes and long hair and with the heart coming out and say that that's your God. Lest ye corrupt yourself and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure. God forbids that. That's Deuteronomy 4.13. And we read Isaiah 44. And read it. Read Isaiah 44, where it says that men cuts a tree, takes part of the wood and, 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 and warm himself, then cook, then makes a piece of furniture, and whatever's left, he makes a little image and, 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 and kneels in front of it and says, this is my God. That's the, the read, Isaiah 44, I'm not lying to you. That's exactly what Isaiah 44 says. In John, 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourself from idols. Why are you putting these idols next to Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, the eternal blood of God in the incarnate Jesus who pays in full for your sins? who is able to drink the cup. What was in that cup that Jesus drank? It was the wrath of God over our sins. Now, what does the Roman Catholic says? The Christian veneration of image is not contrary to the first commandment, which prescribes, prohibit, prescribes idols. Indeed, the honor rendered to an image passes to its prototype, and whoever venerates an image venerates the person portrayed in it. That is their paragraph. So we, God says, no, 
this catechism says yes. God says, you, the day that you will do that, you will die. And the serpent says, no, you will not die. The serpent is able to deny the authority of the Bible. This, I don't know how anyone can live with the snakes. Biting you with a gospel contrary to it. Um, wow. Um, the time is over. Can we take 10 more minutes? No, I think we better finish. Well, you have this. Uh, the, the communion with that, the communi communion with the dead. God prohibits trying for us to talk to dead people on their pain of death in the Old Testament. Here, they not only ask us to pray and to ask dead people to do things, but we even, in the canonization of saints, they ask people to ask for a miracle to a dead person. And with that dead person makes three miracles, then that person is canonized. That's communication with the dead. And that is the canonization of saints. Uh, they, a group of Roman Catholics and, <clears throat> and Protestants, a group of Protestants decided to have, to unite for the sake of peace. And they put together a program called Catholics, Evangelicals and Catholics together. And they agree in being together as long as they don't mention Trent, all these doctrines, and as long as we do not believe totally what the Bible says. But let's believe in the essentials. Let's believe in Christ. We believe in Christ. You know, how do we believe? It doesn't matter. But we have Christ. And the faith that we have in Christ, it doesn't matter if it is only faith in Christ. And you know, as long as we have a little bit of faith in Christ. But the Bible says no. And salvation is by grace because God gave us, according to the Roman Catholics, the grace for us to save ourselves. And uh, the Bible, you know, we believe in the Bible just in some essential things. And the Protestants, the Reformation says, is the Bible alone. Is Christ alone. Is grace alone. So they agree in, in the basic things. Believe in in just basic things and denying the sufficiency of Christ is heretical. You cannot have a union like that for the sake of peace because I didn't come to bring peace into the world. I came to bring war against right and wrong. So they established what they call E. CT, Evangelicals and Catholics together. When they present this to R.C. Sproul and to John MacArthur and to some of the strong evangelical leaders, James Kennedy and others, they say, wow, now you are together. So the Roman church eliminated Trent? No, no. So you eliminated the Bible? No. 
then how can you have together? So they went back, said, where is the word alone? They have left the word alone away. So when R.C. Sproul and all these evangel um, uh, strong evangelicals protested against the evangelicals who had agreed with this, they went back and they have E-C-T-2. And they agree to put the word alone into it. When they put the word alone into it, they came back and said, see, now we have the word alone. I said, okay. So it's Christ alone. No more saints, no more priests, no more. No, 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 no. But you agree on putting the word alone, Christ alone. Say, well, what happens is that we also agree that the word alone doesn't mean the same for us and for them. Alone for us means Christ alone. Alone for them means that they believe in Christ alone, in Christ because uh, Christ gave us the alone, gave us the power to believe in all other, other things. So they went back together and say, no, you, I mean the evangelicals, and, and say, no, we, and I'm going to read what R.C. said. In order to have unity of faith between the Roman Catholic Church and evangelicals, one of the following things, following things would have to happen. Number one, the evangelicals will have to get rid of the word alone, and of the righteousness of Christ, which gives salvation by imputation. If you get rid of that, we can have union. Second, the Roman Catholic would have to uh, give up her status of infallibility. They will have to take out the canons of the Council of Trent and return to the Catholic Church, leave the Roman Church and return to the Catholic, accept the word alone in meaning Christ, faith, grace, plus nothing else, and accept the righteousness of Christ of uh, alone by imputation. If the Roman Catholics do that, then we can have union. Or we can have union if both sides will have to believe the lie of the theory of ambiguity. ambiguity and have an agreement, even though the meaning of the word alone and imputation by the merits of Christ alone do not mean the same thing for both sides. Then we can have agreement. Or both sides could discard the fundamental difference of the Bible, ignore what the Bible says, disregard what Jesus says, close their eyes to the truth of the gospel, and achieve love and unity on secondary manners, which are not of internal importance. In other words, it doesn't matter. Let's unite it. It doesn't matter. And he says, the bottom line is that it matters. And it matters eternally. So there is no way we can have union without dismissing Christ. There is no way we cannot have union without their dismissing all these heresies that were invented by men. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us to complete this course. Oh, Father, that many Catholics who hear this that they will be convinced by the Holy Spirit that your Bible is truth and that there is no other truth. The absolute truth is the Bible. Everything is relative, else is relative, which relativism is not truth at all. And we pray, my Lord, for everyone who heard these conferences, that you had pity upon them and mercy upon them and bring them to the Lord. Jesus, by faith in him alone. It is 
in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.